Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Orange United Methodist Church. My name is Josh Abraham, and I am excited that you have chosen to worship with us. Why don't you go ahead and stand, and we will sing this morning.
lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained.
that showed that you are a humble king. You didn't come riding on a white horse. You came in the form of a helpless baby. But you are near to us. In our darkest times, in our greatest times. For that we cry out, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. It's in your holy, precious name. Amen. You can have a seat. We're going to continue our Advent lighting of the candles this week. We're going to sing the first verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. The words will be on your screen. overwhelm us. There is too much to do. Our lists are long. Our calendars are filled up. We worry that something will go wrong or we won't end up in the right place or take the right route. Getting lost is a real possibility on a journey. And yet, we claim hope for the journey because we follow the one who will travel with us and sustain us on the way. Isaiah says that there is one who is to come who will be filled, who will be the fulfillment of all our hope. The spirit of the Lord will rest on this one, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. We place our hope in this one. We light the candles of peace and of hope to give us strength for the journey. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, that God may teach us the ways of peace and hope. Oh, come that day, spring. Oh, come, oh, come that day, spring, come. Our spirits by thy justice. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and as dark shadow puts to fly, rejoice, 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 Emmanuel shall come to thee. earlier my name is Josh Abraham and I am overjoyed that you have decided to join us if this is your first second or third time here at Orange we would love to welcome you in a special way if you look back there at our welcome table we have a gift that we would love to give you and to tell you more about how you can 
get to know us better at Orange. We have a lot of things coming up in this Advent season. Our Advent yoga experience is happening today. If you are interested in that, come talk to Tiago, who's <laughs> in the front. He's going to lead that, and it's going to be a wonderful experience to connect your mind and your body to this Advent season. Our poinsettias are still for sale. If you'd like to purchase one to remember someone who has passed, uh, please talk to Ray in the office, and she can help you with that. Also, our angel tree. You guys are absolutely killing it this year. There aren't any more presents left, but we still need socks and underwears purchased to give to those people who are in need. Please go back to the angel tree and get more information for that. Also, we have our service of the longest night that's going to happen this week on uh, Wednesday, December 18th, next week actually, at 7 p.m. Uh, if you're interested in that, please talk to one of the pastoral staff, Pastor Corey or Pastor Adam, to get more information for that. Uh, we would love to have that, you at that. On a special note, it's hard sometimes uh, during this season of Advent, especially if you're missing someone, if you're mourning the loss of a loved one, or if things are just hard. And this is, that is what this service is designed to be. It is a service that helps you remember why we are doing this, why hope is here, why joy is here, even when things are dark and hard. For me, personally, I lost my father a few years ago, and he loved Christmas. He loved the season of Advent. So when I go through this, it's hard not to think of him and hard not to be sad. So I'm going to be at this service, and I'm going to pour everything I have into this service just so that you guys can come experience that. Also, if you notice in the back, we have some newcomers who are coming in, so if there is some space in your row, try to slide to the middle to give those people an opportunity to have a seat. Also, we have our Advent Bible study that's continuing. For those people who have uh, done an Advent Bible study for us, we thank you so much. They have been absolutely, breathtakingly amazing. You have poured your heart and your soul into it, and we can clearly see that. And for those of you who haven't got a chance to read them, don't worry. There are plenty of days left to read those. Um, look on the email. They're going to be sent to your inbox daily. At this time, why don't you go ahead and stand up and greet somebody in the name of Jesus Christ that you don't know before. And kids, you can be dismissed to Crosswire. <laughs> pastors here with Orange. It is wonderful to be with all of you here this morning, and it's always especially special in Advent, isn't it? I just love Christmas, so this is a really special time, um, and I'm just excited to be here with you this morning. Uh, please look to the screen this morning for our scripture, which is uh, John chapter 1, 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. 
But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. How many of you have different classifications of friends? Not like best friend, friend, acquaintance type of thing, but this is my friend who I watch sports with, or this is my friend I hang out with when I'm feeling sad, or this is my friend who, you know, I'm feeling feisty, I want an adventure, and I know this person will go with me. You guys do this too? Okay, that's good. Um, it's always comforting to know that my eccentricities aren't quite as weird as I imagine, especially after I reveal them in front of 200 people. Um, so I definitely have different types of friends. Uh, but I'd say one of my most important classifications of friend, or the one that I hold most dear, are my light in the darkness friends. Um, and I'm blessed to have two of those people in my life, and they're the ones that I go to when I'm feeling particularly desperate or dark, and I just need to reach out to someone. Uh, my friends live hundreds of miles away. I'm lucky if I get to see them in person once a year. We probably only even talk on the phone like three times a year. But they know me. They understand me. Uh, they know how I think and how I feel. They are just of the most utmost importance to me. Um, I can be vulnerable with them, and I trust them, and imperatively, to me, they're Christian. I don't say that because I think that non-Christians can't give good advice or be of comfort. That's, of course, not true. Um, but I say it because when I call them when I'm anxious or desperate or in despair, they express their love and concern from me, but then they point me towards Jesus. And that second part is the most important part. They remind me of what I believe in, of what I have faith in. They remind me that God is who he says he is, that he's loving, that he's patient, that he's good, and that I can put my faith and hope in him. They remind me that Jesus is the only foundation for lasting hope. They give me practical advice eventually, probably, <laughs> Um, but first, it's always wrapping me in their care and their love and then pointing me towards Jesus. They are essential friends to me. They don't remove the darkness from my life, but they sit with me in the darkness, point me toward the light, and wait with me until it comes. They are reflections of God's love and people of hope. Last week in Corey's sermon, she uh, introduced us to the season of Advent, that time between December 1st and uh, Christmas Eve, that time when, when we're children, it seems like it lasts for four years. Um, but it's also supposed to be that time of waiting. It's supposed to be that time of anxiety, that Jesus is coming, but not here yet. But Corey also described kind of the strangeness that is Advent, that it's almost kind of a moment of pretend, because, not to get all Easter-y on you, but Jesus is here. It was actually great. We sang it here in our song this morning, in, our, in that last song. Uh, Jesus is here. He's with us. He's already come. And his spirit is with us right here in this room. But for many of us, it's not really pretending all that much. You may currently feel or remember acutely what it feels like when Jesus doesn't seem like he's around. Some of you may feel like that today, that God has abandoned you, or you're in a time where when you need him most, he just doesn't seem to be around. Whether you feel that way or not, we're all living in the tension of a world where even though Jesus has come, he has not yet come in fullness. And we want that bigger portion of Jesus that is going to bring hope, joy, love, and fulfillment in its fullness. Jesus is here. 
kind of, almost. But how do we live in that tension? Welcome to Advent. <laughs> Last week we focused on living in that tension of almost peace. We have it, but not in its fullness. And today we're going to focus on hope. And hope is kind of a weird concept because it is stubbornly abstract. You can't touch hope, you can't prove hope, but you can feel hope. When you feel it, you know it. And again, the song was just perfect. Good choice, Josh, um, for this morning, because hope is like light in the darkness. A few years ago, uh, with the middle schoolers, we went caving because the hurricane, <laughs> hurricane came to the beach the week we were supposed to go to the beach. So I said, let's go to a cave. Uh, and they went with me, um, begrudgingly some of them, but they went with me. Um, and when, as we sat in the blackness of almost total darkness, it was astounding the difference that even the smallest amount of light could make. Just the tiniest glimpse changed the way that we see, that we saw and experienced everything around us. And I think hope is like that. If it's there, there is no mistaking it. And if you have it, it changes everything about the way you see the world around you. It makes itself known. So what is hope? My best description is that hope is a deep desire that is rooted in faith. Hope is a deep desire that is rooted in faith. Hope is most obvious in places of darkness because that's where our desperation, our want, our desire is the strongest. We want something badly when we are in times of darkness. We want change. Our desire is strong. But what differentiates hope from just plain desire is that we give that desire roots. We think that that change is a real possibility. We hope that it will happen, we expect that it will happen, we have confidence that we will happen because something, something has to give us that faith that change will come. We have to root our desire, our hope, our faith in something. My question for you today is what do you root your hope in? What do you root your faith in? Some people root their faith in themselves because that's where they're most confident that change can happen. Some people root their faith in others because those are the relationships that they trust the most. And some people put their faith in blind luck or belief that things just have to get better because, because sometimes blind faith is the easiest faith. Hope, our belief that light can come into darkness, gets its, our strength from the faith that we have and the source in which it is rooted. So what are you hoping for today? And where does your confidence that that change might happen, where is it rooted in? As I reread the Christmas story um, for glimpses of hope, I got hung up in the same scripture as last week, for which I hope you'll forgive me, but in Matthew 1, 18 through 25, uh, that Corey read for us last week, it's the story where Mary and Joseph both hear independently uh, that Jesus is coming. Um, and their first reaction is a faithful reaction that shows that their hope is in God and that he will fulfill his promises to them. That this baby, though unexpected, uh, is one that is coming from God and that he will be with them. Um, and it will be the Son of God. But then they begin the first and the longest advent, not 24 days, but nine months of waiting for Jesus to come. And though their first reaction is a faithful one, they respond to the angel's message positively and with faith in God that he is who he says he is. I can't imagine that in that nine month advent, there weren't times of anxiety and desperation and despair. In those times, what did their hope look like? Before the angel came to Joseph, I bet Mary was simply hoping that Joseph wasn't leaving her, or that she wouldn't become a pariah and shunned by her community, that maybe, if not Joseph, hopefully someone, anyone, will stand with her. I bet there were times that she was hoping she didn't imagine those angels, 
and that God wasn't just using her as a vehicle, but he was going to be somebody who would follow through on his promises to bless her and be with her. I bet Joseph had some of the same hopes, that he was hoping just to get through it. He must have loved Mary to stick with her through this. Maybe he hoped that their weird family that went against all social norms would be accepted. That though not everyone would ever understand, some would. I'm not sure anyone, even with a heavenly visitor, would genuinely hope for what was to come. I'm guessing that Joseph and Mary both, that their hopes were much less grand, that they desired just to make it through the darkness. Can any of you relate to that? In times of darkness, hoping just to make it through? Because that's how I get. When nothing is going down and when nothing is going well, and things just seem to be pressing down on me and the weight of the world seems to be on my shoulders, I don't have some grand desire that I'm going to like rise from it. I'm just hoping to get through it. Whether your darkness makes you feel angry, whether it's a darkness of sadness, emptiness and loneliness, or a darkness that feels helpless and vulnerable, however your darkness feels, I bet there are times of just thinking, I just want to get through this. I just want relief. I want to breathe one of those sighs where you breathe in and it feels like as you breathe out, you're breathing all the heaviness out of your body. And you feel a hundred times lighter and like a brand new person, refreshed and renewed. But where does that kind of exhale come from? What gives your lungs the power to push out all the loneliness, the anxiety, the anger, whatever it is that's in your heart? What helps you push that out? How did Joseph and Mary make it through a nine-month advent? How did they hold on to their desire for that long? Those sighs that have the power to push out darkness and despair come from what we breathe in. It comes from the source in which you have your faith and your hope rooted. What gives you the confidence, the boldness, the ability to expect that your current situation is not your end situation, your final destination, that life will continue will continue, that the future holds light. What helps you believe, not that that path is going to be easy or that it'll come soon, but just that it's there, that you're going to make it out, that light is on its way. Where is that expectation rooted? Is it in yourself? Is it in others? Or is it in Jesus? Because I'm afraid that... <clears throat> If it's anywhere but in Jesus, in times of darkness, you may find that your roots aren't strong enough, that the light of your own strength or the light of others might not be bright enough to shine through the most oppressive of darkness. It's only in Jesus that we can find the light from which darkness flees. It's in him that we must root our hope. How can we have the confidence to root our hope in him, though? A person who sometimes, as we said, we, we search for her for him, but we can't feel his presence. He may seem distant, someone who we don't fully understand. How can you root your faith in Jesus? I think the answer for us ends up being the same answer that it was for Mary and Joseph. Christmas. It's Christmas that gives us hope. Romans 5.8 is one of our or one of our, maybe one of our, one of my favorite verses. Uh, and it's that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well, while we were still sinners, Christ had to come for us first. He came for us and then died for us. While we are still sinners, and this proves Christ's love for us. It's part of our communion liturgy. That the incarnation of God, God made human, Jesus, is the revelation that God is who he says he is. That he loves us fully, he came for us, he is real, he is good, and he loves us more than we could ever imagine. Jesus' arrival gives root to the promise that though we may sit in loneliness, in anger, in anxiety, sadness, disappointment, we don't have to sit in that forever. Jesus' arrival gives root to the promise that he will sit beside us in those times of darkness and wrap us in the warmth of his light and his love. 
Jesus' arrival gives root to the promise that his love will never leave us and that his love can shine through the darkness. He doesn't, promisely to magic, he doesn't promise to magically fix despair or make it disappear, but he promises to surround us with his love and to sit with us in it. Jesus' arrival gives root to the belief that he is not just the ultimate light in the darkness friend, but the ultimate eradicator of all darkness. But that part has not yet come. We're still in Advent. We still need faith. Jesus has come and he's coming again, but we need to put our hope in him. We have enough Jesus to root our faith in him and to hope for what is come. There is still darkness, but the light is coming. Our scripture today, John 1, 1 through 14, is weird <laughs> because of the tense that it's in. It's past tense, but it's also kind of talking about the present day. Um, and it's perfect for Advent because it talks about how Jesus is coming, but he's already come and he's coming again. Um, and I kind of re, I summarized it a little bit um, and put it into what I think is appropriate for today's Advent. And that is this, in Jesus' life, and that life is the light of humanity. The light shines in the darkness and darkness cannot understand it. The true light, Jesus, that gives light to every person has come into the world and is coming again. And all who receive the light, who believe in him, who root their faith in him are children of God. They are loved. They have life. And it is darkness that has no hope. We put our hope in God and not ourselves because we know we're weak. We put our hope in God and not ourselves because we know that even those who we love the deepest will disappoint us. We put our hope in God and not in a random universe because we've all been lost in the darkness for too long and putting faith in nothing is not hope at all. We hope in God because he has shown us that he loves us, that he is who he says he is. Because the creator of the universe humbled himself, put on flesh, and came to die for us, to prove his love to us, even while we still wallowed in the darkness. We put our hope in God because he's the only source of altogether complete, full hope. And when we feel the light of God's love, we're called not to just to stop there, but to also, as it said in John 1, to follow the footsteps of John the Baptist who witnessed to the light so that all may feel its warmth and join God's family. In the season of Advent, we talk a lot about not just receiving, but also giving, and the receiving and giving of hope is no different. When we share the hope of Jesus with others, we must, because it's only when we are all together that hope can survive. We need the warmth and the hope that others give us. It's imperative to share it. Jesus is the greatest revelation and the ultimate revelation of God's love for us, but we too can reveal God's love to others. We don't remove the darkness from one another's lives, but we can sit with one another in the darkness and point each other to the light. My light in the darkness friends don't eradicate the darkness themselves. They are not the source of light and love, but they reflect God's light and love to me. It is God in, who enables them to be people of comfort, of love, grace, and understanding, and hope. Hope must become contagious. We must reflect it to one another. I mentioned the last time that I preached that we like to have fun as a staff in the church. At least sometimes I like to have fun with the staff. <laughs> I was really proud of myself a few weeks ago. I had been downstairs in my office working for a while, um, and I love my office, but it's one glaring deficiency is the lack of windows. There's nothing down there. Uh, so I have no idea what the weather is like on any given day if I've been down there for a while. So one day a few weeks ago, I was on my way up and it was like, is it raining out? Is it brilliantly sunny? And as I was walking out the door just back there, the main office door, 
I had stopped because it was a beautiful day and the sun was shining and it was just streaming through the window so I just kind of sat there in the sunlight for a moment and I had a great realization that if I took out my phone and held it at the perfect angle, I could shine it 25 feet down the hallway into the office right into Josh's eye. <laughs> and I laughed. It was great. I don't know if Josh laughed. I laughed. I had a good time. It was fun. My very goofy point is not that it's very clear why I don't have windows in my office. <laughs> clearly can't be trusted with sunlight. <laughs> but that, that very goofy story is a picture of part of our life's purpose. Not to blind Josh and unsuspecting worship leaders, but to soak in the warmth and the brightness of God's love, to feel its transformative power and the hope that comes with it, and to want to share it. And sometimes, if you share it generously, you can focus it into something that is so intense and glaring that it must be responded to. We are called to be people of hope, but we're also called to spread that hope. We can be agents of hope in this world. It starts by accepting God's light, that he loved us enough to come into our own darkness. And when we, re when we root our faith, in the all-powerful creator of the universe, we accept his altogether and full peace, hope, love, and joy. We know that even though we may find ourselves in times of darkness, we can hope with confidence that he remains there with us even when we can't quite feel the warmth. We have faith that the fullness of his light is coming. And we help others build their faith in God, reflecting his light to them surrounding them in his comforting embrace. And when we do, when we help one another hold on to that spark in the darkness, we help one another's hope remain alive and rooted in the one who is coming, has come, and will come again. Amen. Dear God, we thank you so much for this season of Advent, for its weird complexity, that you have already come, that you are here with us. God, we just pray that you would be here in the darkness with us. We know you are, but we pray that you would make the warmth of your light known to each and every one of us. And that if we can't feel it right now, you would put someone alongside us who can reflect that warmth, that light to us. God, sometimes our faith falters and our hope falters. Help us renew our faith in you. Help us root our faith in you. Help give us hope. And help us be reflectors of your love to those around us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. This morning, <laughs> uh, I'll let Derek do the intro. Or Josh do an intro. But... Uh, as, as the choir is about to sing, the choir is about to sing, uh, we're going to collect our offering this morning. And our offering as we give a part of ourselves can be a reflection of the hope that we have in our hearts. So I pray that you will give as a reflection of that hope.
heaven declaring do you see what I see you go ahead and stand up and we will continue to celebrate the hope that is here.